Hello, everybody who signed on. We have about 120 people signed in, probably going to get a few more, but we're going to go ahead and get started um, since it is 530. Um, my name is Dr. Rosen, um, and I'm a urologist here at Michigan Institute of Urology. Oh, what a lovely old picture of myself. Um, pretty much what I look like. Um, I went to Michigan State for medical school, did my residency locally, and I've been working with, uh, you're at Michigan Institute of Urology now for about, um, going on about six plus years now. Um, and I see a lot of overactive bladder, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, the condition of overactive bladder as well as incontinence and um, what we can do to help you. All right, so just to start off a little anatomy lesson, um, your kidneys make urine, the ureter tubes, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but the ureter tubes bring the, the urine from the kidneys down to the bladder and then that's your urethra where you pee out of, um, or urinate, excuse me. So um, within the bladder is uh, muscle tissue, it's called the, the detrusor muscle, um, and when the detrusor muscle is uh, stretched out or the bladder is full, that's what activates um, the um, urinary reflux and causes you to urinate. Uh, for that to happen properly, all the parts of the system have to be in coordination. So that is including um, reflex pathways, signals to the brain, um, the musculature within the bladder, um, and everything uh, that connects the two systems. Some of the most common problems that people can have regarding the bladder um, would be overactive bladder and incontinence. There's three types of incontinence, which we'll kind of go into um, in a bit more detail a little bit later on in the talk. But the main um, thing to know is that these things are very common and they can really happen to anybody. Over 50 million people in the United States suffer from overactive bladder and about 25 to 33% of people in the United States also suffer from incontinence, um, which is a leakage of urine, if you're not uh, familiar with that term. Um, they are similar, the, the conditions of incontinence uh, and the, the causes are similar in that they all cause leakage of urine, but there's differences in, in why they occur and how they're treated. So we'll start off with overactive bladder. So overactive bladder, is kind of defined as the sudden uncontrolled need or urge to urinate. Um, overactive bladder is kind of a term for a collection of symptoms. Um, it's not, it's not a, a disease in and of itself, but it's more of a condition that is characterized by several symptoms, including um, your bladder not being able to hold urine normally, the sudden strong urge to urinate, which you cannot control. Um, uh, visiting the restroom eight or more times a day can be a characteristic of the problem of overactive bladder. Um, accidental leakage uh, can also be an issue. Um, that would be more urge incontinence um, with that. Sometimes people feel like they have trouble urinating, which can happen with overactive bladder, but sometimes it's a kind of a mixed signal where your brain and bladder aren't communicating appropriately. So you feel like you have trouble urinating even though you're actually not very full. So a lot of times people will come in and say, I can't urinate. You know, I, I know that my bladder's full and I feel this very strong urge and I go to the bathroom and I can't urinate. Well, that can be the disease of overactive bladder. Um, also what's called nocturia or getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom uh, two or more times. It can be normal to go to the bathroom once or twice, but once you start getting up more than that, it's very disruptive to sleep and can be, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of negative effects on the, the next day, your daily life. As far as incontinence, we're going to go over those kind of three types of incontinence. And incontinence can occur with or without overactive bladder. Um, a lot of times people have both problems or multiple kind of issues um, that all kind of come together, but they can all also happen separately. So incontinence, again, is the inability to control your bladder um, and the leakage of urine specifically. So the first type of incontinence is stress incontinence. Now it's not when you're really busy and you have a bunch of appointments and <laughs> that kind of stress. It's the physical stress on your bladder. So your bladder leaks when you put physical stress on it. So when you do something that puts pressure on the bladder, like cough, sneeze, laugh really hard, lift up something heavy, jump on a trampoline, stand up, shift your body weight. Sometimes even intercourse can cause um, stress incontinence. Um, now, 
On the other side of the coin would be urge incontinence. Um, that's when you get the urge and you can't make it to the bathroom in time. Like I said, a lot of people have both of these problems, um, but they can also be occur separately in, in, in some people. So as far as urge incontinence, it's kind of characterized by the strong or sudden urge to urinate. Um, it's caused by bladder spasming, your bladder kind of squeezing at an inappropriate time when you're not on or near a toilet. Um, and it causes that uncontrollable urge and the loss of urine. Uh, that is typically more common in women, but it can also happen in men. It can happen in people who have had, all these things can happen in people who've had kids, not had kids, younger, older, um, like I said, men, women, it doesn't discriminate. It can happen to anybody. The last type of incontinence to kind of um, touch on would be overflow incontinence. So that actually is a problem of your bladder being too full and overflowing. So if you imagine like a glass of water that's already two thirds of the way full and you just keep filling it, it's that overflow that's leaking out. So a lot of times people will come in and say, oh, I, I urinate all the time. I, I, I don't have a problem urinating, but they're not actually emptying their bladder. That would be overflow incontinence. Uh, leaking or dribbling because the bladder is too full. And a lot of times that's happening because you can't empty your bladder completely um, for a variety of, of reasons. Um, it could be structural, something like a urethral stricture or narrowing. It could be neurogenic where you've had back surgery or some other nerve damage, a stroke, something like that, that causes your bladder to not work. Sometimes diabetes, bladder decompensation and, and, uh, and uh, nerve and muscle damage from that. There's lots of reasons that that can happen. Um, so those are the three types of incontinence. So as far as the cause of bladder control problems, it's kind of a complicated thing to discuss. We can't always point to something and say, oh, this is the cause of your problems. There are tests that we can do um, to try to figure it out. And also, you know, of course, taking a detailed medical history, um, looking at your medications, things like that can help us to try to figure that out. Um, but, um, you know, some of the causes as far as um, uh, things that we can, can look into would be anything that damages or weakens your detrusor muscle um, or causes inflammation, things like that. So things that we look for would be bladder cancer, inflammation, stones within the bladder, um, diabetes, like I said, having a large prostate can be very hard on the bladder and cause a variety of bladder issues. That would be a, a problem in men. Um, estrogen deficiency or vaginal atrophy can contribute to those symptoms. And like I said, um, uh, nerve problems from herniated discs, spinal cord surgery, um, stroke, those can all uh, contribute as well to these types of problems, overactive bladder and incontinence. Uh, other things on the list, like I said, medications, alcohol intake, caffeine, um, obesity, that could be an issue for, you know, stress incontinence pushing on the bladder, though often um, that's really not the whole picture. Uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, stroke, which I've already mentioned, pregnancy and childbirth, that would be a transient or uh, a condition that doesn't last forever, but certainly can cause problems, um, you know, while you're pregnant. And then childbirth can cause problems down the line, although, again, I'd like to reiterate these problems can happen to anybody, whether you've had vaginal birth, C-section, have not had kids, have had many kids, you can have these issues. People who have had radiation to the pelvis, so men or women who've had radiation for any reason to the pelvis, that can cause bladder problems. Um, any surgery in the pelvic region, whether it's a nerve disruption, um, uh, damage to the musculature, things like that. UTIs can definitely cause worsening of overactive bladder symptoms and sometimes can be the catalyst. You know, people have a UTI and then afterwards they say, you know, even though my UTI has been treated, I still have these symptoms. So even though it's not an active UTI, it's caused some inflammation or some change that has, uh, you know, kind of revealed these overactive bladder problems. Pelvic organ prolapse or feeling a bulge kind of down below in the vaginal region. Um, sometimes that can be an issue if you're not emptying all the way. Typically that does not cause kind of the overactive bladder symptoms, but sometimes it can. So these are all things uh, that we look into. Um, and I'm going to go kind of through how some of these things are diagnosed and some of the tests that we do to try to figure out what exactly is causing your problems and how we can best treat you. Um, so some things that we will do in the office is a um, urinary a urinary stress test. So what we do is a physical exam where you have a full bladder and we basically have you cough, push down really hard. We see how the urethra moves, if it moves, if you have leakage, when those things uh, 
uh, happen and we can kind of tell, you know, is it true stress incontinence? Urodynamics is a test to tell us how the bladder is functioning as a storage unit. It gives us a lot of um, data points, including bladder pressure, capacity, um, how's the urethra functioning? Are there bladder spasms? Do you leak with the coughing, sneezing, even if we didn't see it in the office? Um, and and uh, several other data points that are really useful for determining the best course of treatment for you. Cystoscopy is also a really important tool that we use to um, try and diagnose what exactly uh, might be contributing to your bladder control issues. So what that is, is a, is a scope, is a camera that we use to, to look inside the bladder. So it goes right into the urethra, takes about 30 seconds, doesn't hurt, and we're able to see, are there any bladder tumors? Does the musculature look normal? Are there any ulcerations? Is there a lot of inflammation? Um, does it look like you're not emptying your bladder all the way when you go? Um, it's, a, it's a really important tool that we're able to utilize thanks to modern technology. Um, your analysis done every time you come to the office pretty much, um, so always try to come with a full bladder. Uh, we always wanna make sure that there's no infection that could be contributing to your symptoms or you know, look for any blood in your urine or anything else. And then um, measuring a post-void residual, which is a, a ultrasound that we do right in the office. It's called a bladder scan. So after you go to the bathroom, we are able to scan your bladder and see how much urine is left inside your bladder to see if maybe like we were talking about that overflow incontinence, if that might be part of your issue. Another thing that we'll have a lot of patients do, depending on you know what the history is and and how you're describing your incontinence, is a, a, a voiding diary or avoiding log where we'll have you write down um, how much you're drinking, what time you're drinking, how much you're going to the bathroom, are you incontinent, are you leaking, what were you doing when you leak? So this is kind of an example of what one might look like. There's um, uh, several different um, uh, uh, variations on this form that gives us different, again, data points to determine the best course of treatment for your um, specific problem. So as far as treatment options, we have a few um, kind of a stepwise approach to, to treating these, these bladder issues. Um, of course, we always want to do the least invasive thing first, okay? So a lot of these bladder issues are treated with counseling, basically. So lifestyle changes. Are you drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages? Are you are you drinking right up until bedtime? Are you drinking three glasses of water before bed? Um, you know, should you be exercising more, weight loss, things like that? Um, the next step would be oral medications if those things don't work. Uh, there will be testing done in there, like we talked about cystoscopy and neurodynamics. A lot of times that, that might even be done before you give any oral medications. Um, uh, if that seems to be indicated for you specifically. And if oral medications don't work, then you may um, require a procedure. And uh, sometimes you need a procedure and medication. It, de it depends, again, on um, your specific symptoms. This is really a condition that's unique to everybody. Everybody, you know, requires a different, different treatment plan. So again, just this is kind of a, an example of the algorithm um, for treatment, uh, how we kind of try to do it at Michigan Institute of Urology. Now, that being said, an algorithm is not one size fits all. Your doctor will determine whether or not it seems like you need testing before they proceed to giving any medications, um, or if it seems like you know, that's not necessary. So, so again, every, every, every doctor will have a little bit different variation on this, but, um, you know, some things that we'll start with, of course, again, the lifestyle changes, potentially pelvic floor physical therapy, um, which is physical therapy to help strengthen the pelvic floor that that can be super effective and important, um, just for overall pelvic health. Um, again, potentially oral medications after the initial evaluation with once the voiding diary and behavioral modifications have been done, um, you would follow up usually about a month later um, with either your doctor or a nurse practitioner. If you're not doing well, again, you might get testing, which you may have already had, and then we'll have our third line options, which we will also discuss today. Um, so we talked a little bit about the lifestyle uh, changes um, a couple slides ago. So again, talking about hydration, sometimes we have patients who come in and um, you know, they say that they're going to the bathroom about every 30, 60 minutes. They are getting up two, three times at night, maybe more. And once we get their voiding diary back, they're drinking about 200 ounces of fluids a day. Well, sometimes we just need to adjust that uh, and the problem goes away. So we talk a lot about hydration, diet, caffeine intake. Um, we talk about constipation. That can be a very big um, 
contrib contributor to uh, bladder issues, both to not emptying your bladder very well or having to go to the bathroom too much, as well as UTIs and things like that. We talk about exercise, pelvic floor strengthening, so Kegel exercises. We might have to send you to a pelvic floor physical therapist, so therapists that are trained in pelvic floor uh, physical therapy, just like you would go for physical therapy for your shoulder or your knee. They are specifically trained for pelvic floor. Um, we talk about bladder training. So once you get the urge, maybe trying to hold the urine for a minute, then two minutes, things like that. Working on kind of retraining the, the muscle memory and the reflex um, uh, to go to the bathroom to give a little bit more time between trips to the bathroom. And then um, controlling urgency again, just with the strategies that we have discussed above. If those things don't work for you, you might proceed to oral medications. So what those medications are intended to do is to relax the bladder, to help with urgency, frequency, getting up at night, um, uh, and not making it to the bathroom in time once you get that urge. That's what the medication is for. It may or may not help with the leakage when you cough, sneeze, laugh, so kind of that stress incontinence that we were talking about before. Um, if it does, that's great. If not, there's other things we can do for that. I think. I'm not sure if this talk gets into that. We can talk about that if you come into the office and have more questions about that. Um, but as far as these medications go, yes, the, in, the intention of that is to um, re uh, reduce the, the frequency of the trips to the bathroom, getting up at night, and the urgency. Sometimes these medications can take about four to eight weeks to reach their full effect. Um, a lot of times people see you know, change as much sooner than that. But typically we won't see you back for at least a month to, to eight weeks after starting these medications to give them time to work. Um, now there's two classes of medications. There are anticholinergics, which are um, more of the classic bladder medications. Some of you might've heard of ditropan, oxybutynin, detrol, vesicare, things like that. Um, and those medications do have some uh, potential side effects like dry mouth, constipation. Those are probably the two most common ones, sometimes blurry vision, a little bit of altered mental status. Um, and there's many medications within that class just because you have side effects with one of them does not necessarily mean you will have side effects with another. So sometimes it takes a few different medications, trial and error to see what would work for you. Unfortunately, there's no formula to tell us what would be best for you. Um, it is just trial and error, but a lot of times we can manage these conditions with oral medications. Now there's another class of medications called beta-3 agonists. Those medications are a little bit newer. The main drawback is insurance coverage, so that is improving slowly. <laughs> um, those medications don't have the same side effects of the dry mouth, blurry vision, constipation. Um, there is one medication in that class called Mirbetric. It can cause high blood pressure or hypertension. It's not necessarily, you know, in somebody that has had a history of high blood pressure, it kind of doesn't discriminate. It's rare for that to happen, but it's something that we monitor for. The other medication in that class would be called Gymtessa. Um, that's the newest medication, has a very good side effect profile, but again, the coverage is more of the, um, the uh, barrier to entry there. If oral medications don't work for you, the next options would be procedures. So there's a few different procedures that can be effective for overactive bladder and urge incontinence. Um, the first one to discuss today would be called sacral nerve stimulation. You may have heard of an inner stim device before. Um, you might have friends that have, you know, sort of a nerve stimulator. Um, and what it is is a little kind of a pacemaker for the bladder. What it, we do is insert a small wire down in the nerves by the tailbone, and it controls um, the impulses to the bladder um, using using this this uh, stimulator. It's very small, about that big. Um, it is a procedure that requires anesthesia for the full implant, um, and it is MRI safe now. The newer ones, so that's a that's a huge um, uh, benefit um, of the newer devices. And before we do any surgery, the great thing is that you'll have a trial. So typically, that's done in our surgery center. Um, where if we need to, we can use x-ray to make sure it's in the right place. And we make sure that it works for you. So you basically wear an external battery pack, kind of like a belt around your waist for a few days. And if it works for you, then we would schedule you for the full implant. Um, the next option to discuss would be posterior tibial nerve stimulation or PTNS for short. Um, also another name you might see is percutaneous tibial neuromodulation. 
And what that is a fancy word for is a small needle that you can see in the picture that goes into one of the nerves um, in the back of your ankle. And uh, studies have shown that that can help control the impulses to your bladder. Um, the goal, again, with all these procedures is to restore bladder function. Um, and we do that by measuring the reduction in your symptoms. So we use measurable, um, you know, questions like how often you're going to the bathroom, how many pads you're using, things like that. Uh, the treatments um, take about 30 minutes. They take place right in the office. You don't have to like go to a surgery center or anything like that. It starts with um, every week for six weeks. And then uh, you can do an additional six weeks. Um, if I think I just lost my connection. I'll just back up a little bit. Um, so the way that it works is you do it right in the office. You don't uh, have to go to a surgery center, anything like that. Um, the, the, the treatments last about 30 minutes, right in the, again, right in the office. Uh, you'll do six weeks, once a week for six weeks to start. Um, if you need to, you do an additional six weeks. And then uh, typically you'll do monthly maintenance sessions um, if that's working well for you. And then the last option to discuss today is Botox. Um, so Botox is um, can be a really good option for people with uh, refractory or overactive bladder that hasn't responded to medications. Um, what we do is inject the Botox, the actual Botox directly into the bladder muscle. So you can see that this uh, picture shows somebody using a, a camera, a scope, similar to the scope that you'd have in the office. Sometimes we use a little bit different shaped scope, um, but it's similar to the one that you'd you'd probably have already had by this point. Um, and then we use a very tiny, tiny, tiny needle <laughs> to inject several places within the bladder. And it helps to relax that bladder muscle. It's partially paralyzed. But yeah, what we want to do is paralyze at least some of those um, muscle fibers to reduce overactivity. It's just like if you do Botox in your forehead, it should make it not, make your forehead not move so much. We want to make the bladder not move so much. Um, you still should have more than enough control to empty your bladder uh, voluntarily. There is a very small risk of retention with that procedure. It's very rare for that to happen, um, but can occasionally. Um, but typically people do great with that. It's usually done about every three to six months, depending on how you do. Um, and those are really the three main options for overactive bladder that does not respond well to oral medications. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the cause. Um, and the treatments as far as, and sorry, excuse me, that's a little bit about the causes, the workup and the potential treatments for overactive bladder, urge incontinence, um, and, uh, and those kinds of conditions. Um, we'll probably have to do a different talk about stress incontinence, I think, because we didn't touch on that today, but that's definitely something to be discussed at a later date and something that you can discuss in the office. Um, and now I'll kind of open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? You can go ahead and type it into the chat. I'll give it a minute and then I can answer anything that pops up. Thanks for coming. Oh, I should mention my offices. I do practice in a few different offices. Um, I go to an office on uh, Hall Road in uh, Macomb. I'm also in Novi and uh, in Livonia. So if you... Um, uh, feel like you need to come on in, just give a, give a call to uh, Michigan Institute of Urology, or you can also um, request an appointment online. We have that ability now as well. And again, I'm Dr. Rosen for anyone who um, uh, missed the opening of this uh, little talk today. All right, so far I don't have any questions. So one person said that recently they've had weight loss surgery and they've gotten a lot of relief from that. So yes, that is one of the things that I kind of talked about earlier in the um, in the talk about uh, you know lifestyle changes. So I think that this person is is very right in encouraging you know weight loss, healthy diet, exercise. Those things can all definitely help with overactive bladder and incontinence. Um, are there any? any um, vitamins that can help. There's not necessarily any vitamins um, specifically targeted towards overactive bladder. Um, there's things that you can take for, um, you know, bladder health in general, uh, but not specifically for overactive bladder. If you have, oh, this is a great question. If you have a nerve stimulator and it's not working, can you get Botox? So there's a few different things I'd like to touch on 
in terms of that. So the first thing would be once the last time you had your stimulator um, interrogated, you always wanna make sure that all of the leads are working, that the battery isn't dead. There's different settings that you can try. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, but the next thing is, can you get Botox? The answer is yes. If your nerve stimulator is not working, you've exhausted all options, it's, it's just not working for you, then certainly Botox would be an option for you after that. Um, all right, let me scroll up a little bit here. Can hip pain be a part of overactive bladder? That is not a typical symptom of overactive bladder. Um, but certainly if you have hip pain, if you have any you know, lower back issues, things like that, that can contribute to overactive bladder symptoms. Can you take ditropan at night before bed? Oh, this is a great question. So ditropan or oxybutynin is one of those bladder, you know, oral medications that I spoke about earlier. And the main thing with these medications is that you want to really take them at the same time every day. They're formulated to work for 24 hours, okay? So uh, as far as taking them in the evening, um, if your main problem is nocturia or getting up a lot at night to go, I do tell a lot of people to try taking it in the evening, usually around dinner time. Um, bedtime might be a little bit late to, you know, for it to kind of start working and get those effects. There's no reason that you can't take it right at bedtime. Um, but if it's not working uh, great right at bedtime, maybe a few hours before that. Um, the other thing is you, you want to limit your fluids in the evening. So stopping fluids about two or three hours before bed. Um, so it's another reason why dinner time might be a, a better choice. Um, but can you take it before bed? Sure. If you're taking it before bed every night and that's working for you, that's totally fine. Does cranberry juice help? So cranberry juice is not um, a treatment really for anything, but the benefit of cranberry juice, cranberry supplements um, in general, uh, as far as the research goes, has been shown to um, help prevent one certain type of E. coli from binding to the lining of the bladder. So if you have chronic urinary tract infections, it might be useful for you. I certainly, you know, won't hurt you, um, but it's not necessarily a treatment for overactive bladder. Is Botox generally covered by insurance? And also the same question regarding the sacral nerve stimulation. Yes, insurance on these, um, both of these treatments is, is generally excellent. You know, I can't comment, of course, on, you know, people's specific co-pays or anything like that. But yeah, we, I, I personally have not ever had an issue with insurance coverage. The only thing is typically they will make you try oral medications, sometimes up to three oral medications before it is approved. But generally, yes, insurance coverage is great. Are these three treatments safe? I previously, so this person previously had a sling, I think is what they mean, a transvaginal tape, which is a sling. Again, that would be a different talk. That would be for stress incontinence, which is again, really a separate issue. So I always tell my patients to think of these problems as two separate issues. You've got overactive bladder. That's really a bladder problem, okay? Your bladder is squeezing too much. You're going too frequently. You're getting up at night. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, you're getting the urge and you can't make it in time to the bathroom. That's, that's a bladder problem. Now the leakage, when you cough, sneeze, laugh, lift up something heavy, you know, stress incontinence, like we talked about the physical stress on the bladder, that's a urethral problem. So if you've had a treatment for the urethra, okay, stress incontinence, um, you would not typically, typically have to remove that sling that you've already had. Uh, your doctor will probably want to make sure that there hasn't been any erosion of that mesh into the bladder, that it's not too tight, and that's not what what is causing your problem. Sometimes if it's too tight, that can be what causes the problems, then you do have to have it removed, and then the problems go away. Um, that being said, if you have treatment for stress incontinence first, so if you have a sling or something like that, there's always a chance that the bladder could become very unhappy, uh, and those overactive bladder symptoms can get worse, even though your sling is really doing what it's supposed to do. Um, it can just kind of reveal that you actually did have kind of some underlying overactive bladder and urge incontinence. So to answer the question, um, the sling would not generally need to be removed. Usually you can just start on treatment for overactive bladder and go down that pathway. And are the three treatments safe? So um, yes, these are all safe FDA approved treatments. Um, any, any, treatment or um, surgery always has risks and benefits, which are all things that your doctor will go into in detail regarding all three of them. But are they safe generally? Yes, these are very low, um, minimally invasive, uh, low risk of side effects. All, all these procedures are, 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 are considered safe. 
Can overactive, oh, that's a great question. Can, I love these questions. Keep them coming, you guys. I could sit here all night. Um, can overactive bladder be exacerbated or worsened by life stress? So yes, the bladder is very sensitive to stress. And sometimes the way that we manage that, now we talked about in the very first few slides, lifestyle changes. Sometimes the, the treatment is psychiatric treatment, um, therapy, uh, uh, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, changing your job, you know, things like that. Yes, stress really can exacerbate overactive bladder um, symptoms significantly to answer your question. How much does diabetes affect, affect overactive bladder? So that's a really interesting question as well. And I don't have um, a perfect answer for you because it's super complicated. If your diabetes is not well controlled, then yes, that can have a significantly negative effect on your bladder, but that can be really multifaceted. It can cause your bladder to not empty very well. It can cause it to be like, you know, more reactive, like we said, overactive bladder. So um, that would be really a question um, to answer in a one-on-one -on -one kind of office visit where you can really discuss uh, the details of your diabetes and how it's affecting your life and other systems within the body. Um, okay, and then the nerve stimulation near the ankle, is it kind of like acupuncture? Where is it done? Or Okay, so the question is, um, as far as the PTNS, the, the ankle nerve stimulation, is anything left in, in place when you leave the office? No, it is like acupuncture in the, in the sense that everything is removed um, before you leave the office. Um, nothing is left in place between sessions. All right. And that's all the questions that I have so far. Um, I'll give it one minute and see if anything else pops up. These are great questions. Thank you so much. Okay, here's one more question. Oh, this is a great question. Um, oh, I love this question. Somebody says that they had a hysterectomy around the age of 30, so pretty young. They never took estrogen due to cancer warnings in the 60s. Is lack of hormone replacement a factor in OAB? So lack of hormones, certainly, like I said, it can cause vaginal atrophy. Um, and that can cause symptoms that really mimic overactive bladder. So that urgency, frequency, sometimes people say that they just have kind of pelvic discomfort, heaviness, pressure, um, definitely can contribute to UTI. So all those things. Um, and the way that we treat that is with a very, very low dose topical estrogen that you apply around the opening of the vagina. And that can be super effective for improving a lot of things. So the overactive bladder symptoms, if you're getting UTIs, things like that. And, and the, the most important uh, kind of aspect of this question, they said they never took the estrogen replacement because of cancer warnings in the 60s. So that was so many years ago. We've done so much research now about the low dose estrogen replacement. It has been proven over and over again to be very safe um, when used appropriately. And um, even in people who have had breast cancer, uh, sometimes can still be good candidates for um, low dose topical estrogen. And it really has not shown a recurrence of that. Now, if you've had a different kind of estrogen um, mediated uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, that would be a little bit of a different discussion. Um, but typically, yes, these are very safe, um, especially for people who had hysterectomies um, for fibroids and things like that that are really not hormonally um, mediated. Um, if you had an early hysterectomy, you'd most likely be a great candidate for uh, a low-dose topical estrogen to help with those symptoms. All right, anything else? Let's see. Okay. I wish I could see if anybody's typing. All right, I don't see any more questions. I really thank you all um, for coming tonight. And if there's anything else um, uh, that we can do for you, please, please, like I said, don't hesitate to make an appointment. Um, and I hope to see a lot of you in the office. Everybody take care. <laughs>